All right, sorry for the delays. So this is safe cracking for everyone. My name is Jared. Okay, so a little bit about me. I am a lock sport enthusiast. I have been picking locks for close to 20 years now, and I got into safe manipulation shortly after. Uh, so I've been doing that for about 15 years. Uh, I game a bunch, um, and I'm a professional rock climber. That's like my main source of income at the moment. So this talk, this talk will cover how specifically group two mechanical safe locks work. So there's different classifications, which I will go over. And group two is sort of just the standard sort of security classification for safe locks. Um, whatever safe you buy, essentially, if it has a mechanical lock on it, vast majority of the time, it will be a group two uh, safe lock. I will cover the flaws in this design and how we can exploit them, as well as variations on the techniques that we use. Um, and then I will also cover differences between group two safe locks. Uh, they all operate on the same principles, but there are some slight differences that set them apart from each other. So the security classification starts with group two as the lowest security classification. And there is absolutely nothing preventing anyone from figuring out the combination. Um, and then group 2M, there are some small improvements to where they make it a lot harder to manipulate. And then group 1 is the high security classification, where they add in a lot of extra features. And um, supposedly, they're supposed to withstand manipulation for about 20 hours minimum. Uh, however, that is completely false, and um, I don't actually understand why they have different groups, because they all kind of suck at the moment. Um, and then group 1R is the same as group 1, but the R stands for uh, radiologically resistant, so uh, a common attack could be using x-rays to view the inside of the lock. And so they make the parts inside out of plastic, usually Delrin, a low density plastic, and it makes it really hard to x-ray it. So I will cover the parts of a lock here. Uh, normally I would go up to the screen and point, but however, I don't think that's possible. So you should see a large brass circle in the center, uh, and it's got a bit of a cutout on it. That is called the drive cam. Sorry? And the microphone's gonna be okay there? It should be okay? Okay. All right, cool, so here, this is the drive cam. This is connected directly with a dial. So as you turn the dial, this drive cam will turn as well. We have this arm. This arm is, uh, we just call it the, the lever. But this protrusion is called the nose. And that nose, as you can see, rests on top of the drive cam. Behind the drive cam, we have wheels. All right, so when you dial the combination on one of these locks, what happens is these wheels, they have a cutout called a gate in them. Okay, there's one gate per wheel, and dialing the correct combination lines up each of these gates with each other. Now, behind the lever, you can see a bar. That bar is a fence, that's what we call it. And when you dial the correct combination, all of the gates will be lined up under the fence and that is so that the fence can fall into the gates. So here we can see the correct combination has been dialed. And when you turn the drive cam so that this cutout is underneath the nose, that allows everything to fall down. And what that does is turning the dial further here, pulls on the nose, and allows the bolt to be retracted.
if I can get this camera to show at least somewhat, I can show a little example here. So we are looking at the top of the lock, and you can see, and you can see there is a bar, and that is the fence. Behind it, underneath it, are the wheels. When you dial the combination, uh, here we go. Okay, it will line up each of the gates underneath that fence. Sorry, it's a little hard to keep this in view. Okay, so I am lining up the gate underneath the fence. Sorry for the uh, technical difficulties here. Not sure how visible that is. All right, well, we'll just go back to the slides. So essentially, the way that it works is each of the wheels, in turn, grab the wheels behind it. So that drive cam, which is directly connected to the dial, has a protrusion, much like this wheel does here. And that protrusion will ride in a groove on top of the wheel behind it until it hits the, the protrusion on that wheel. And so essentially, it can freely ride around, and once it makes contact, it will grab that wheel, and it will turn with the dial. That wheel on the bottom also has a protrusion. This is called a, a drive pin. That drive pin will ride in a groove on the wheel behind it until it hits that wheel and picks it up. So it takes one rotation to ensure that you have picked up the next wheel. That's because if you are moving the wheel in one direction and you reverse rotation, you have to go all the way around until it can pick it up again. Here's an example. Um, I put this here in case the camera didn't work. Um, I would like to show this more visually, but this is the best I have at the moment. So we can imagine this black piece at the back being the drive cam and each of these wheels being one of the wheels in the lock. So what happens is this, this drive cam will spin around, and here it's making contact with the drive pin of this third wheel. The wheel closest to the drive cam is called the third wheel, then the second, and then the first. And so if we wanted to spin this wheel in the other direction, this drive cam would turn all the way around one full rotation until it can hit this drive pin. And same thing for this third wheel. If we want the third wheel to pick up the second wheel, it has to go all the way around until it hits the drive pin, and so on and so forth. And so this is how all the wheels are able to move together, but also be able to be set separately. So vulnerabilities. So here, we have a close-up of the drive cam. Now, the nose normally rests on top of the drive, drive cam. It will rest and ride along the whole outer edge of the drive cam as the drive cam spins. But when we get to this drop-in area, the nose will drop in ever so slightly. And the vulnerability here is this is not symmetrical. This drop-in point is asymmetrical, and on one side, we have a great curve to it. And so you can see, the further down we go in this drop-in point, there is less wiggle room. From one side to the other is significantly less than up high. There's much more wiggle room up there. And the thing about this is, because that nose will go a little bit into the drop-in point, when we turn the drive cam, we can feel it hit 
the wall of that drop-in area. We can actually feel that on the dial as a bit of resistance. So if we spin the dial so that this drop-in point is centered below the nose, that nose is not touching the drive cam at all. And if we turn a little further, then the nose will hit the edge, as in this picture right here. And we can feel when that happens. So if that nose is up high in this contact or this um, drop-in area, then there will be a significant distance between the two points of contact on the walls of that drop-in area. And if the nose is lower, there will be less distance between feeling those points of contact. Now, the thing that determines how high or low that nose is in that area is the fence. The fence here, you can see, is resting above the wheels. So we have the nose that is on the drive cam right now, and that is what's keeping that fence up. But when we turn the dial, so the nose is over that drop-in area, then the fence will fall down and rest on the wheel pack. That is essentially testing for if the combination is correct or not. If the gates were all aligned, then the fence would not rest on top of the wheel pack. It would simply fall in, and that would allow the lock to open. So here, you can see the wheels are all different sizes. That's because we are not able to manufacture multiple wheels to be exactly the same size or to be perfectly circular. So here, we will always have one wheel that's larger than the others. As you can see here, it is the first wheel all the way to the left, furthest from the drive cam. There's space here on the second and third wheel. So if we were to turn the dial so that the nose is over that drop-in point, this fence will hit and rest only on this first wheel because it sticks up above the rest. Now, this is where the previous slide comes in handy with the narrower space, the further down you go. Because if we were to feel those contact points, that point at which the nose hits the wall of the drop-in area, those are called contact points, and we measure how far apart those are, we would get a certain number, a certain reading. Let's say on the dial that is six increments. But if we were to turn this first wheel, and only this first wheel, so that the gate is underneath the fence, this fence will not be resting up as high anymore. It will drop onto the next largest wheel, causing the nose to be further down in that contact area. Which means that our points of contact are now going to be closer together. Instead of having a range of six, <coughs> sorry, six numbers on the dial apart, maybe we can feel those points of resistance five and a half numbers apart. And that tells us that we have the largest wheel in the correct position. So if we had, let's say, dialed a test combination, and this is what we have, and we measure the contact points to be six numbers apart, and then we dial the same exact test combination again, but with a different number for the first number in the combination, which corresponds to the first wheel, and that places the gate underneath the fence, and we see that decrease in the contact area, then we know whatever we just changed for that first number is the correct number. So you can see here it is resting on top of the first wheel and first wheel only. This fence is not touching the second or third wheel. So if that first wheel does rotate so that the gate is underneath it, the fence will drop lower and we can feel that difference in the dial with how the, the nose touches the uh, sides of that contact area. So essentially, we have our plan of attack. What we can do is we can find what's called a common low point. And that's because the wheels are not necessarily larger or smaller than the other wheels. They can be bumpy or irregularly shaped. So if we have the wheels in the correct position, maybe there is a bump on another wheel preventing that fence from falling down completely. So we want to find a point where across every wheel is a common low point, where there are no extra bumps or ridges on any of the wheels, and we have that nose as far down in that contact area as we can. And we do something called wheel isolation. We will isolate the third wheel. So essentially, if we are only moving one wheel at a time, 
and we get a reading that the nose is lower in that contact area. So we can feel the points of resistance where we feel the nose hitting the sides of that, of that drive cam and we feel that decrease and only one wheel is moving. We know exactly what number and what wheel is in the combination. So if we're only moving the third wheel and we move it from 10 to 12 and we have a drop in that, in that reading, that means 12 is the third number in the combination. It makes things really simple. And then we have to look for gate signatures, which is that drop that I have been talking about. Feeling the drop in the range of the, of the two contact points. Once we find that, we can find the center of the gate. We want to be precise because there, there is a range at which the, the lock will open that is not the correct combination. If you set your combination to be 10, 20, and 30, then you can open it with 9, 21, 29. That is a valid combination. Most locks will open plus or minus one and a quarter numbers on either side. So we want to find the center as close to the true combination as we can in case we made a mistake along the way. And we can repeat these steps for the second wheel. So essentially we can move only the second wheel in the lock by itself and so if we find a gate signature, if we find a decrease in that contact area, then we know what our second number in the combination is. And there is no need to do this for the first wheel. And that's because if you have two numbers in a combination that has three numbers, you just brute force the last one. You just dial every two increments, and then you don't have to worry about trying to uh, manipulate the lock and get a reading. Now there's a reason we go from three to one. And that's because the wheel that is closest to the drive cam is wheel three. And that lever is spring loaded. It has a spring pressing down on it. That spring is only on one half. So it causes it to tilt. So when you are, <coughs> so when you are turning the dial, so the nose is over that, that drop in point, the fence will hit the wheels and it will actually tilt and cause it to only make contact with wheel three, I want to say 90% of the time. And I say 90% because it's not always the same due to tolerances, but that is also why we find the common low point. That is why we find an area across all the wheels that don't interfere with each other, that there are no bumps, is that it will help us ensure that wheel three will be the first wheel that the fence touches. So the way we find this common low point is we can spin every wheel together and we can take contact point readings, which means you go to the place at which you can feel that resistance, which you can feel that nose hitting the side of that drive, drive cam in that, in that uh, contact area. When you feel that resistance, whatever number that is on the dial, that is your contact point reading. After that, so, so we pick up all the wheels and we take contact point readings every 10 increments. What that means is we will move every wheel together and on the dial we will stop at zero. Then we will turn to that contact area and get our contact point. We will then turn all the wheels to 10 and then 20 and then 30. So every 10 increments we take a contact point reading and we find the lowest reading. We find the reading at which the wheels read the lowest. So that is when the nose will be furthest down in that drive cam. We can leave the first and second wheels there so we can turn the dial until only the first two wheels are moving and leave them there. Actually, the third one moves too, but we can, it, this gets the first and second wheels out of the way and we can then proceed to move the third wheel as we see fit. That third wheel is closest to the drive cam, so it is the first to move. So if we have our first and second wheels somewhere, we can move the third wheel without interrupting them. So with the third wheel, we can then spin and pick up the third wheel after we drop the first two off where they need to be and we can move it every two increments. So we can take that third wheel and let's say we can start on zero. 
okay? And then we take a contact point reading, so we just turn to that drop-in point and feel for the bit of resistance and see what number's on the dial. And then we can go back to where we left the third wheel from zero. We can then turn to two, go take a contact point reading, and then go turn our wheel to four, take a contact point reading. So we do this 50 times around the dial. And because we're only moving one wheel, whenever we see a drop in our contact point reading, we know that number we just turned the third wheel to is our third number in the combination. There is no ambiguity about it. From there, we can actually go back and just move the wheel through that area again. So if we find a drop in that contact point when the third wheel is at 30 or let's say 32, we can go back and because we went every two increments, we can hit all the odd numbers and we can find the exact center of where it needs to be. If we do not have a gate indication, that's actually fine with this method because we can use the lowest point and pretend that is our actual number. And simply repeating these steps with the lowest points will actually give us the real, the real number in the combinations. The second wheel is a little more difficult. Um, I am kind of skimming through this because my camera is not working, unfortunately. I can't show this visually. Um, but the second wheel is just you, you turn different number of times, but we're doing the same process. We are finding a way to move only the second wheel by itself inside the lock. So when we get an indication from the dial, we know it is the second number in the combination. And for the first wheel, if we had two good indications, then we can brute force the first wheel. Dialing zero, then the second number and third number, and then two, second number, third number. We're just dialing full combinations. And what that does is allow us to cut down on the amount of time we, need, we spend dialing, since going by every two numbers will open the lock. We can also keep track of the lowest point still, just in case we were wrong earlier. If we just keep pretending that the lowest contact point readings we get is the real number in the combination, we can keep on repeating this process and eventually those low points will become the real numbers. So there are different types of group two locks. One second. Oh. Sorry, just trying to make sure I don't go over time here. So there are different types of group two locks. Um, Lagarde 3330 is a very common one. It is not one I suggest starting out with. The wheels are more oval. And what that means is we want our gates to be of each wheel under the fence in the lock. That is what tells us what is the right number or not. With oval wheels, one wheel may shadow another wheel, meaning when we have a gate underneath the fence, another wheel could have a large bump on it because it's oval and might be keeping the fence from falling into that gate. We also have Diebold. It's a very common uh, lock for ATMs, uh, banks. Their drive cam is U-shaped. It is more symmetrical than what you have seen. And so in that case, we can actually take both contact points very carefully and that will give us the same results. Uh, here it's a little off screen, but this is the most common model that you will see. Uh, Sergeant and Greenleaf 6730 or 6741, they are virtually identical. One can just be opened with one and a half numbers on either side, so a little easier to open. Uh, but event, essentially they're the same, and this is what I suggest everyone to start with. Um, after this talk, I will have a table with a bunch of these set up in the lock picking village, uh, and you can try hands-on. So these are really important tips, okay? These are not just tips if you don't succeed. These are things you have to go in knowing. And the most important is being precise in everything, not just dialing, but 
reading the dial from the same angle every time. If you look at it from the side, that will change what you see on the dial. Um, you want to read the contact point with the same amount of force. So we can feel when that nose hits the drive cam, and that's our contact point. However, we have to feel that with the same amount of force every time, or we will get a different number on the dial. We can also try with a known combination. And what that means is knowing the combination. So if I know the combination is 10, 20, 30, I can only test from 0 to 40, for instance. And I know I should have an indication in that area. So I do not have to waste my time with numbers that I know are not in the combination. And so that helps, helps with getting a, a feel for what you are looking for. Uh, you can also remove the back cover and look at inside the lock while you do it. And I have removed all the back covers on the locks that will be for demonstration in the lock picking village. So you can look inside and see what's happening. I apologize, I had some technical difficulties. So I understand that things are a little, little complex with how I'm describing it, but we do have in-person demonstrations at the lock picking village. And if all else fails, I do have a book. So the book is safe cracking for everyone on Amazon, but you don't need to buy it. That is only if you want the hard copy version. There is a free PDF. If you search the title of the book on YouTube, safe cracking for everyone. There is, it's like nine parts, but the first video in that series, part one, will have a link to the PDF of the book for free. Other great resources are also the lock picking subreddit and uh, LPU Lockpickers United Discord. There should be a link to that Discord in the subreddit. There's also a game called Sophie Safe Cracking Simulator. I, I don't know who Sophie is, but this is the best safe cracking game as that's all it is. It is just a lock and you can turn the dial and there's different tools in this game where you can have x-ray vision, you know, you can practice with all these different variables that you can set up that you can't do in real life. And of course, the best resource is practice. Um, I teach at a locksmithing university and I have my safe manipulation course is about 18 hours long. Uh, that is not enough time for someone to be proficient. With guidance, someone can open their first lock in that time, but I mean, I, I recommend at least 50 hours before you are even proficient in, in this field. The hardest part is learning. Once you know and understand how a lock works, then it's easy. It's just understanding that and getting the information that takes time. Here is a direct link to the book. Um, I just hosted on Google Drive. Hopefully this QR code shows up well enough, but this should take you directly to the PDF and you can download it and read it. I do include information on high security safe manipulation. This book, as far as I know, is the only place of that information. You cannot find that anywhere else. And by high security safe manipulation, I mean there are locks in the group one category that have been around this. These designs have been around for a while and their methods of opening them are not new um, and they are very insecure and they are not publicly available so I decided to make that publicly available and this is the only place that I know of at which you can get that information. And that is, that is it. Thank you for coming. Um, I really apologize for the technical difficulties and the convoluted explanations but we will have in-person demonstrations you can try yourself at the lock picking village immediately after this. Thank you.